Welcome to the Inspirational Insights from Insight to Action podcast. My name is Donna Jones. I'm your host, and I'm excited because today we're talking with Colonel John O'Grady on about how the military works with uncertainty and ambiguity in high states, life-threatening conditions. It seems to me that while the world is grappling with COVID-19 pandemic and really in a, a great place to shift our competencies with how we work with these kinds of interruptions, decisions are still being made. Some of them are effective and some of them make things far worse. And I couldn't think of a better place to learn about how to work with environments that are totally unpredictable, where all the things, all the variables are moving and there's a lot of ambiguity. Colonel John O'Grady is a 30-year-old vet, 30 year, not 30 years old. I just subtracted. I just I made you younger. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Kind of you. <laughs> a 30-year vet with the U.S. military. For, born and raised in New York, attended the U.S. Military Academy, and now is the founder and owner of O'Grady Leadership Services, where he works with high-performing and high-potential individuals, really people that want to, are seeking to be the very best version of themselves. So lots of depth in terms of his experience, a couple of tours in Iraq with U.S. Special Forces, both Afghanistan and Iraq. He takes a theory and puts it into, and has been putting it into practice for quite some time. So his role then now is to inspire and challenge individuals to really win uh, on, on a more repetitively successful way by becoming, uh, by developing themselves more, more expansively using these conditions that we talk about, that we're talking about today. John, what can we learn from your experience in preparing for what the world is dealing with now, the coronavirus pandemic, or any other situation where even at the executive level or where, where, where you're moving into a new zone and all the variables have changed? First, let me just say thanks for having me here. You know, I really uh, look forward to just sharing some insights as we have a discussion, you know, with your various listeners. And uh, for the listeners out there, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. And I hope you find it valuable uh, use of your time. And so, uh, you know, really it's, 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 a, it's a life 30 years of training for ambiguity, uh, chaos, um, complexity, and uh, crisis. And then either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, being able to have some opportunities to put that training into actual practice. Uh, you know, whether it was leading a 500-person organization into uh, Afghanistan you know, that organization was exceedingly distributed, uh, not unlike probably a lot of business leaders and other folks find themselves in today's environment with the pandemic, right? All of a sudden, you know, you had everybody kind of around you and, and you know, put, put your arms around some folks and face-to-face -face meetings and, and no longer is that necessarily viable or even desirable. And we did that in a uh, area that was expansive. It was probably the size uh, roughly of um, Rhode Island that this 500 person organization of mine went into. Now we, we did partner with uh, some Norwegians. So I had to figure out how do I, how do I operate in that space, um, in that type of environment, uh, in a distributed manner. So those are just, that's just one example of some of the experience uh, that I can kind of bring to bear right now, as you would, you know, alluded to in the opening. There's a lot of anxiety and fear, both about what's going on and what it all means and, and what comes next and so forth. When you've walked into those environments, how did you handle that kind of fear or, or the fear about just the unknown and everything moving potentially quite quickly, quite possibly for the worst? So I think there's a, a couple of uh, things that, I, that I'd share as, as I think through that question. The first one is I was pretty fortunate being in the military. And like I said, we, we purposely train for those situations, right? And so while you can never replicate exactly, or let me uh, rephrase that, you can't duplicate what you will find in a combat environment, but you can, you can really work hard at trying to replicate that to some extent in your, in your training, right? 
And so first immersing yourself and, and those who you're going to lead in that environment to the extent that you can, to the extent that it's acceptable, to the extent that it's not putting people at unnecessary risk, you do that. Again, the military, I, I was fortunate to be able to do that in a fairly immersive and, and intentional way. Um, but I would offer that as business leaders and other folks who are listening out there who are leaders in whatever space they may be, athletics, inside their family unit, wh whatever, you can still go through some things that help, help you think through those environments, right? It isn't difficult and it shouldn't have been difficult, quite frankly, for folks to think through, okay, what might a pandemic, you know, mean to my organization, um, to my family? And I think people shy away from that naturally because it tends to be a, a fairly macabre exercise. It feels that way, right? But when it's not in your face, yeah. Yeah, you know, the exercise, though, isn't about thinking about the dark side of things. It's, it's thinking about putting myself in that space, but with a purpose. And that purpose is, how will we respond? What will it feel like? What are some of the things we're likely to experience? That has huge benefit. And so one of the things I would hope people learn from this, or organizations learn from this is, if you don't have something built in routinely to your organizational, I, we, we, in the military, we call it battle rhythm, but routinized events, whether it's quarterly, semi-annually, you know, instead of doing the um, ho-hum feel-good leadership retreat where people are going to fall back into each other's arms and catch one another, and then we, we you know, we kind of all forget about what that really was within a, a day or two of that, that excursion. Well, why don't you take some time with some of your, your thought leaders, some of your mid-level leaders, bring them in and just run through a couple of, you know, one-off kind of what we, again, would refer to as black swan scenario and capture that so that in the event that does happen, you at least have a start point, you come off the shelf and you can start thinking about, hey, remember when we were in a calm vacuum, you know, scenario, this, these were our thoughts then. And that helps center you. Uh, so that's one, you know, critical way that you can do it in, in a preparation kind of way. Now, there are other things we could talk about the moment you now find yourself in it. So in terms of preparation, I mean, with or without any kind of crisis situation, even when I watch some of the governments that are making decisions, they've been doing their budget without any preparation whatsoever. It's the assumption is that the price of, for example, the price of fossil fuels will continue to rise and did absolutely zero scenario planning, or at least if it, they did, they neglected the one that that calls for it went down. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so I think what we're talking about here is the preparation is very much around what you know. How how do we actually train our brains and train ourselves to think through uncertainty, knowing that in fact, just accepting that that's the way the world is right now. It's we're, we're long ways from having everything lined up and going everything and going according to some sort of plan that is going to vary from from one set of interests to another. Yeah, you bet. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up scenario planning, because again, that's a, a part of, um, you know, what I was just speaking about, right? And so in the military, we'll, we'll do scenario planning. And that does a couple of things. It really strips out a lot of the bias uh, that, that may occur, right? Um, it helps you capture those key assumptions. And now you have at least what those assumptions are. So that when you find yourself in that, the first thing you're doing is going, okay, which of these assumptions actually still stands? Which of them are no longer valid? How does that affect what we thought about in the scenario? And in, in very broad brush strokes, you know, if you had the uh, north-south axis being threat and the uh, east-west axis being likelihood, right? And down in that corner where those two intersect, that's obviously the lower end of that spectrum, and they go out to the positives, right? And when you break that out and you break that into what would end up being a, a quad chart of sorts, you, you end up with four quadrants, right? And in the, where the threat is high and the likelihood is low, you have your most dangerous, least likely, right? And then, you know, where threat is low, likelihood is low, it's least dangerous, least likely. And then the other two quadrants are, are in the spectrum where the likelihood is high 
right? But the threat is changing and you would have most dangerous, least uh, most likely and least dangerous, most likely. So now you have these four basic kind of chunks in which to uh, start coming up with assumptions, some planning, planning considerations, et cetera. And it really just helps frame the potentially, again, ambiguous, chaotic, complex scenario that we could potentially find ourselves in. It reminds me of a lot of when I was training uh, and actually facilitating decision-making processes and we were doing risk assessment and so forth. We used to use the probability and severity as, as the axis for determining, and it sort of ended up, I don't think, I can't remember being a quadrant because it was a long time ago that I did this work, but, but uh, I do remember it come, us coming up with probability high, you know, severity low, probability low, severity high. So yep. it, it, it gave you all of those places where you go, okay, this is something we really need to look at just because the impact is something we can't ignore. Yeah, yeah, and where we get caught you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? And, you know, so efficiency is the big thing that every business is driving towards, right? And you're eking out every last little. The, the downside of that is in things like just-in-time delivery, right? Just-in-time logistics. Okay, you, you lose with that efficiency, you lose capacity to respond in a number of those scenarios in a way that you were positioned well. Um, and that's a, that's a tension that needs to be really thought through and worked through. And we're seeing it play out today when everybody, everybody's continually asking herself, well, how could we possibly get that? You know, how could the, how could we not have enough ventilators? How could we not have enough vaccine? How could, how could, right? Well, yeah. there's one very specific reason why, because we're so efficiency driven. And when we get to a point where we develop that system and it's so efficient, it only takes one kink of that critical chain to get impeded, broken, disrupted, to cause the entire chain to start to very quickly unravel at a rate far faster than anybody might have ever imagined. Boy, am I glad you raised that because what we're talking about is something I'd love to see go. I mean, I think if we're going to restore humanity back into workplaces, the efficiency mantra has to go. And what you've just raised is the fragility of that sure. kind of, of reliance on something that is more mental than it is, you know, in terms of if you want to engage people, you're not going to engage them at the head level. It's going to be a full, full, full heart, you know, full hearted commitment. Essentially. You bet. You bet. When we talk about, you know, both scenario planning and actually getting into the field, like the immersion part where you, you suggested earlier, talked about earlier, there's an emotional part of this. And I, I know when we think of the military, we, we have a tendency to think, oh, those guys, you know, emo emo they don't deal with emotions. You know, it's just like in business, they say, oh, those emotions, they'll capture you. You've got to stick with the rational. When in reality, biologically, that's just not how it works. And, and it's also not how it works neurologically. So Sure. For for the military, knowing that, which I mean, I tend to find military preparation for being human, like the early work on, on naturalistic decision making that um, Gary Klein did way back when was all done with the military. It was wonderful recognition of the dance between intuitive and, and you know, the like the full spectrum of cognitive processes. Sure. This long way of me getting to the question around emotion. What kind of attention is given to when you're scenario planning, where things aren't real, to stepping into those emotions so it feels real enough that you can mitigate the biases that will want to downplay things that are distant, not immediate, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I think in the scenario planning part, it, 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 it's considered when you are thinking through, okay, we're going to take this scenario now and actually create a training environment or a training uh, exercise or a training opportunity that we're now going to bring humans into to actually run through this. And we, we run things like computer simulations. We send actually people to uh, training centers. I'll speak for the Army, um, which I'm familiar with, you know, the National Training Center out in California. We have one down in uh, Louisiana, one in uh, Germany. And I mean, you know, those, those are literally immersive. Those are live, virtual, and synthetic training environments 
that you run people through. And so there's a spectrum of how much of the human emotion is going to get generated depending on the type of um, vehicle you're going to use to train people. And then now with all the uh, various virtual reality as well, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing things where, you know, you're, you've got the goggles on and you dial up a, a, an environment and, you know, bam, it's you and five people who are left and right of you are entering a building to go capture, you know, a, a high profile individual or something like that. And it's, it's you know, uh, that's about as immersive as you can get. You know, the other thing we do is also it's not uncommon to uh, link up various physiological sensors on the human themselves as they're going through this type of training. So that not only are you, are you going through and after the exercise, evaluating the externalities of the human, but you also look at it in real time and layer the internal things that are going on inside. So things like heart rate, as an example. HRV. Uh, are, yeah, are, right, right. Are getting monitored so that we can be conscious about, okay, yeah, we all went in the room. We did this particular task. It was, it was successful. You know, now let's look at, you know, all our heart rates. Oh, well, you know what? We still got some work to do in that, in that category, maybe. Yeah. Now, why is that important? Because, uh, again, you know, this, this division or split, we seem to cognitively find convenient, which is splitting rational from emotional. Why is paying attention to heart rate even important? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, I don't want to get too uh, nerdy into the, you know, the neuroscience uh, behind it, but you know, clearly the mind is, is a driver of the body, but then the body provides sensory back to the mind and it becomes this loop of, you know, information, assessment, reaction, response, right? And, you know, it, it's, it, it factors in in a number of ways. But one of the key things that we, we know when we're talking about fear, which is a, you know, pretty prevalent today, is that there are things that you can, you can, do with intention that lowers the, the human natural, quite frankly, right? So first acknowledging that like, hey, I feel this, right? You know, give it a name, figure out where it sits in your body, because each of us is going to manifest differently, right? Some people are going to eat a lot, other people aren't going to eat at all, right? As an example, uh, some people are going to start sweating a lot, some people not at all. Um, and, and understanding that response so that you can begin to optimize the human performance as a whole. Um, and there are a number of techniques you can use, breathing techniques. Um, I talked a little bit about it in terms of the, even as we were talking about the scenarios, right? You go even deeper and you start doing some visualization techniques, et cetera, that can really help uh, condition the body in terms of how it responds to that type of stress. Yeah, excellent. Nice, nice uh, summary. We've talked about fear, you know, privately before we started doing this program, mm -hmm. and, and you just mentioned it, so I'm going to pick up on that now. Sure. We talk about fear, and and I mean, the big distinction is people are afraid of fear. From my, there's a lot of fear of fear, which means <laughs> means you're right. you're either saying, well, I'm not afraid, when actually you have no idea that in fact all your physiological symptoms would say you are afraid. So right. that's the one part of it. The second part of it is that we talk about, in other words, that would lead you to avoiding dealing with fear. The other one is to walk through it, which mm -hmm. I know in my own personal evolution, I faced a, a lot of ups, like, like uncertainty and ambiguity is the norm for me for some reason. I think it was just part of training for this moment, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. But, but what it means is, you, you know, metaphorically, I know what walking through it means. But when we talk about that from a military point of view, from your experience point of view, what does walking through fear mean relative to the other version, which is, you know, the, the, like the straight psychologically induced fear, which says, hey, you're not facing someone with a guy who's trying to gun and, and who's trying to shoot you. Talk about that, if you would. Yeah. So, you know, to me, I think it's, it's, not, it's not even so much fear. It, it's, it's the feelings associated with fear. And, and we create those, right? We, we, we give it its own attribution. 
each of us as individuals. Now there are clear commonalities, right? Um, and you've mentioned too, right? And the one I love is amb ambiguity plus uncertainty equals fear, right? And I've, I've, I've heard that from a couple other people, uh, some in the special operations community. And I want to say, I uh, can't remember his first name, but Divine. Um, are you talking about Rich Divini? Divini, thank you very much. Yep. Okay. And I, 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 think, I think that may be attributed actually to him, but regardless, you know, so in, in that case, saying, okay, you know, how do I kind of personally understand fear? How do I deal with fear? And once you can begin to unpack it a little bit, what you can then do is when you find yourself in those situations or you're thinking through situations that might elicit those feelings associated with fear, you can figure out how can I start to buy down that fear, right? And so again, the one I, I, I use and I like is the ambiguity plus uncertainty equals fear, because when I'm talking to various executives or other people that I may be providing advice to in, in moments like this, we, I lay that equation out for them and then I go, okay, so how can we start buying down some of the uncertainty? Right. Because everybody wants to gravitate towards, oh, well, you know, I don't know this. I don't know. Oh, all right. OK. Yep. That, but that's the ambiguity. But what do we know? Right. What information is being given to us? How do we start buying down in little ch micro chunks? And then you just keep stacking these micro chunks on top of each other. And pretty soon what you realize is your overall fear and all the feelings associated with it start going down. So hopefully that that's an answer uh, in part, at least to your question. It definitely is. And it goes, it takes me back to, uh, I think in HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review, there was an article on the, on the uh, uh, reactor in Japan that did not melt down and it did not melt down. It was under the same conditions where all the crisis management plans epically failed only because they all three things happen at once and they hadn't allowed for that. But, but um, the, the manager in charge of the second plant laid out what wasn't known. And then as things became known, they ticked them off and it, it just gave people the confidence to know, Hey, we can do this. So right. yeah, brilliant, brilliant way of explaining that. So it's really what, you know, if we look at today in terms of executive decision-making in terms of personal decision-making really doesn't matter. It's working with those micro things you can control working with one step at a time so that you can, you can contain the uncertainty, if you will, uh, and, and use it to, you know, use it really more effectively. You bet. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and what each one of those actually ends up having an exponential effect, yeah. you know, as well. It's uh, like a dollar cost averaging in, in the <laughs> investment world. Think of it that way. Right. Yeah. 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 We talked about immersion, you know, you're in this place. Here we are in this, in this uh, experience that's we're sharing worldwide. All of a sudden those boundaries around everything come down. Uh, everybody's sharing in this experience and self-care for decision-making for anything else is right at the top of the list. More so when you're walking into the field where bad things can happen, but in this case, it's because people are afraid of what can happen. So if we look at emotionally, physically, and, and I mentioned, and you mentioned in our conversation spiritually, what, what are the things that come up in preparation and dealing with those things in the moment, in, you know, absolutely being present in the moment? Yeah. Um, so um, in terms of what is a person going to be experiencing it through those? Different... How to work with that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there's a couple of, a couple of things in terms of specific techniques, but you know, one of them clearly is the connection between the breath, the mind and the body. Those are autonomic. Really what we're talking about is autonomic uh, response, right? It's those things that you're not even conscious about, but if you raise some awareness, at least to your breathing, and uh, what you find is there are breathing techniques that you can use. I don't, I don't practice them daily. Uh, there was, there have been periods of my uh, my life though, like when I knew I was getting ready to go into a deployment. Uh, in the in the deployment, regardless, every day I would at least practice that, r whether I thought I needed to or not, because that in and of itself serves as an incredible release valve this breathing it's box breathing is the technique you, your, 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 your listeners can google it etc very simple technique it's almost it's so simple that, that it's almost like you, you know really man come on now but um, um it works um there, there's science behind it you don't have to believe me but 
just through my experience, I know for a fact it works. And what it does is it helps to be a release valve in a way when you're going through this breathing technique for stress, right? Because there's eustress, EU stress, which is actually, you know, a healthy level of stress. It's actually a good thing for us to have that level of stress. It's analogous to if you were to look at if look at your skin under a um, under a microscope. I mean, there's all sorts of bacteria that's on our, our all of our bodies, regardless of how clean we think we are. But those are all healthy. They're, they're actually good. They're, they're keeping all the bad things away. Um, that's like you stress, right? Then there's distress. That's like not good. That's kind of, you know, that's bad. That doesn't help. And so the breathing helps keep you out of that distress space. Or if even if you find yourself getting into it, it helps bring you back to a healthy level of stress. And that's hugely important because we know that distress is associated with um, a kind of a tunneling and narrowing of thinking, almost like your brain is uh, the mental aperture of your, of your ability to really think um, starts to constrict. You get anxiety, depression, you know, so those are the things that we're trying to buy down with this breathing technique. And then it improves clarity, focus, and what all of that ultimately allows for is optimal performance regardless of situation. And optimal performance, that the definition of what that is, 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 is very variable and it, it is changes given the context and the situation you are actually in. And I can talk about that a little bit more because uh, I know exactly what I'm thinking about, but <laughs> I, I want to stop there for a second because that was a lot, I think. A lot, but I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to walk people through that method? Because I know I I sort of did a short video, awkwardly, needless to say, on, on Instagram, put that out. And also Stephen Kotler, uh, with, with respect to peak performance, we talked about that yeah. in a podcast we did that's on this uh, on this program elsewhere. It's a, something I did previously, but so we've talked about it already and, and I sort of covered the steps, but would you be willing just to walk people through it just because it, it gives a chance for people to buy down some of the anxiety that I'm hearing a lot about right now? Yeah, sure. So it's really, uh, think of it as three steps, right? And the first step is, I mean, ideally you get yourself in a space, especially when you're first starting this out, that's, that's somewhat free of distraction, okay? But, and then you can graduate to, you just do this any place quite honestly. And actually, I used to have fun, kind of a little bit of fun doing it. Uh, but anyway, three steps. Uh, step one is uh, uh, br you breathe in through the nose, right? So inhale slowly through the nose. And, and you do that for uh, approximately four seconds. And then you hold your breath, not, and make sure you're not like, you know, like really clenching your mouth and you hold your breath for approximately four seconds. And then you exhale through the mouth as well for approximately four seconds. So it's, right, and you hold, and then it's a, through the mouth. It's, it's really that simple. And then you repeat that process, you know, approximately three to four times. And I have used this, you know, I mean, there was, you know, I, I was at one place, you know, and I get the call that says, hey, sir, you know, they need to, this is in combat. You need to come to the TOC, which is a operations center, the hub of all information's flowing in. You know, we've got reports of casualties. And I said, okay, I'm moving, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm heading in there. And before I stepped in there, I just said, hey, Sergeant Major, who's the guy who's with me, I said, one second. And I, I went through that process before I actually went in and tried to just kind of clear myself, center myself a little bit, and then walk in with enough composure and clarity to be able to optimally deal with an exceedingly suboptimal condition. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. 
It's a great example. And I thank you for, for walking us through that specifically. I know Stephen, the way Stephen describes it, Stephen Kotler, is, is that when you're breathing calmly, while you're, the back brain is, is sort of, well, you know, it's wanting to panic. There's some <laughs> desire yeah. to, to freak out. But the calm breathing sort of goes, that's okay. Everything's good. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of tricking the brain really to, to, to calm down at a time when it would normally just be going off the charts and, and you know, you, you could potentially lose it instead of. You uh, bet. Yeah. And, and I would defer to Stephen, um, you know, again, I'm not a neuroscientist, right? Uh, I'm a practitioner of some of the things that neuroscientists tell me are beneficial and I've put them into practice in some less than, like I said, in some pretty suboptimal uh, situations. But the neat thing is, you know, again, I said, I used to have fun with it, right? You know, I mean, Hey, I was a dad of a teenage daughter, right? And you better believe there were times where my heart rate and everything else was going through the roof. Right. And, and I'd sit there, you know, and and sometimes she'd even be like, are you doing that thing again? And I'm like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, because if I don't, um, you and I are both not going to like what my immediate, you know, reptilian (laughs) brain response is going to be, you know, as an example. Or you just find yourself sitting in traffic or any other number of things, right? So what I would offer to your listeners is pick the top three things that just kind of get under their skin that maybe don't even deal with another human being, right? I mean, like in terms of directly, you know, like sitting in traffic, that's an indirect effect, right? And when you find yourself starting to get, just go ahead and just kind of, just practice that. And what you'll find over time is it's almost, it's like uh, weightlifting, you know, start with some of the easier, little or less annoying things, right? But annoying nonetheless to you, right? Like, oh, uh, I don't have milk for my coffee. I ran out. Okay. You know, (sighs) right? Go through the breathing thing. And what you find is it's like, like I said, it's like weightlifting. Start with the little weights, right? And then get good at that. And then, and then go ahead and keep stacking bigger and bigger weights on that bar. And over time, if you practice this, you're lifting a lot of weight more so than you would have ever given yourself credit for. So that's just a challenge, a call to action for your listeners. (laughs) It's a it's a great call and thank you. And by the way, Stephen's not a neuroscientist. He would he would uh, be upset at that. But he he does yeah, right. he, he's but, a flow 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 per, you know peak performance yeah, yeah, flow. Yeah. So which is the you know a different aspect of optimal. So I really appreciate you defining the you know what optimal performance means is distinct from flow, which is a another level or another layer. Sure, to, which is yeah. distinct from peak. Exactly. Right, because yeah. that's the other thing. When people find themselves in these, especially periods of crisis, that tend to be extended everybody's natural response is I need to peak. Yeah, well, uh, I'm here to tell you, I don't care who you are uh, and how good you are in any of these various principles, whether it be Steven, you know, just a, a regular practitioner dude like myself or others, you can only peak for so long. Yeah. And, and, and typically what happens is whatever that peak was, coming down the backside is almost as dangerous as not, getting up the top side. I think you and I talked about this where yeah. if you, you know, you listen to, um, you know, very like mountain climbers, like legitimate, you know, and, and, and what, what you find is more people die coming off the back end of the mountain than they do the, the, the going up because they don't realize, Hey man, I need just as much energy. I need just as much, if not more oxygen, Right. And, and they run out of those things because they, they work so hard getting to the peak. And so where you can optimize performance, regardless of the situation, is, is generally going to be better, especially in extended periods of crisis. Um, yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have the capability to peak from time to time. Absolutely. That's that's essential. to do. Well, I think the, the opportunity here is to train yourself to get to know what you're accessing at any given moment so i mean this is where the you know you went earlier when you and i were chatting this is where for me it's the the big deal is contextual awareness and i see that as being quite different from situational where you're just working with a bracketed type of situation but contextual is what's the situation or what's the context behind the situation that's likely driving 
you know, what's going on. So you need some flexibility to go in there and say, okay, in this context, I'm in optimal is, is, is what I need. And in this situation, well, wow, I can, I could, I can go for it because, uh, because the variables are all, the mix is right for, for that right. to happen. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, opt, you know, optimal for me in a firefight where we're running low on ammunition is uh, going to be different than, uh, you know, if I'm out for a jog on a sunny day, right? Yeah. Those levels of what, what, I, what I accept as optimal in those two situations uh, is, is fundamentally different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to do something with you now, if you don't mind. I want to take the kinds of high stakes decisions that we've seen with respect to handling COVID-19, present two different versions of how executives make decisions, and then talk about the mindset and the impact on strategy, because that's the work, you know, that you do, you know, and, and we both do, but very differently, obviously. I'm just going to start by laying off the scenarios, and, and I just happened yesterday to learn about a company that I'll talk about as the good case scenario. <laughs> Okay. Yes, there are some. There and, are and, some. There are many. Actually. Yeah, there are. Pump the good um, stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the first one is, we've seen, this is the not so good scenario. This is the one that's on the cover of uh, Fast Company right now, the the uh, massive layoffs that have been going on in the United States. I think 6 million people have just applied for EI. The layoffs in situations where layoffs may not have been the only option, where uh, and I just read about a company that got together and said, hey, what, what, how can we work with this? And they came up with some solutions. Like, yes, that's the idea. So the executive level decision making that said, oh, we've just got to panic. We're going to lay our people off. We are not going to breathe. We're just going to do it. And then there was one company that I heard of that ordered their employees to go to work regardless of the risk. And that sent the clear message that their health was worth risking, was, was worth wasn't being valued. They weren't being valued, despite of what mm -hmm. the poster said on the door. So that's the that's the one scenario. The, the med the, the company I want to talk about that I learned about yesterday is Medtronic, which is uh, one of six companies who produce ventilators worldwide. It's a U.S. company, and they responded to the situation by open sourcing their specs for ventilate for their ventilators and their designs, so anyone can produce them, and that allows countries that don't have, you know, really the resource, you know, the resources that allows them to do some, what, what they used to call in the Arctic jerry rigging, you know, you, you can improvise, you know, it's a very sure. creative people when you've got minimal resources. Uh, the second thing they did is that they sell at one price for everyone. So Sierra Leone, for example, has one ventilator for the whole population and the price is the same for Sierra Leone as it is for everywhere else. Whereas in some instances, there are companies that vary the price based on size of, you know, country or company or, or whatever. And the third play thing they did, which I, I think really reflects the heart of this company, is they tackled the tough question of how to allocate these ventilators that they are producing. And they based it on data, but they based their decision on need because they were not just shocked about how nations are competing instead of sharing, but they were really looking at what, what's needed and how do we meet that need in, in, the, uh, in the best way we can. So obviously you can imagine that from an internal point of view, there's a, you know, that triggers passion with the employees. The employees are completely engaged, totally different. And by the way, I need to thank Kim Pullman for that, um, that story. Two different, uh, very different approaches in terms of mindset and in terms of strategy past COVID. What happens with these two versions? That's a great question, and I don't I don't know if anybody clearly I don't think anybody you know nobody knows right. But I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you at least some things to for, to consider and for your listeners to consider and for those people out there who are in charge of making decisions right now. Um, here's what I do believe: the people at the the, the ones who are most remembered are the ones who are at the tail ends of the bell curve in how they act and how they respond. And the, you know, you could either be, you know, kind, caring, and helpful, right? Or you could be toxic, greedy, and selfish. It's a choice. It's a value proposition. Because again, I fundamentally believe when it all said and done, 
those who are most remembered are the ones in the tail. And so you got a choice, figure out which tail you want to be in. Okay. The other thing is, and what will help you is if you not only have values, right? Because I go into all sorts of places, values up on walls, values on flyers and handouts, on their websites, et cetera. And then you ask anybody inside the organization to you know, give me three values. And they're like, my values? What kind of value? No, you know, the way you work, values. You know, like, Whose values? Yeah. Yeah, no. And so you need to be intentional, again, and purposeful and deliberate and routine about the choices you make so that they reinforce the values that are truly values that you say you ascribe to, all right? Because those are the thing, the values are what anchors you. And again, this is a great benefit that I've learned through my time in the military and something I wouldn't trade. But we are, we, we pride ourselves on being very values-based. We uh, inculcate the earliest recruit with that. And then we routinize how we are constantly doing that through ritual, through routine, through tradition, a whole host of ways, uh, how we select leaders, et cetera. And by no means are we perfect at that. Lord knows we're not, okay? But we do, we do try our best to be, and we do have a benchmark for ourselves that we're constantly striving for. And so, um, you know, if, if you find yourself in an organization or you're the leader and you wish you would have been a little more intentional about those things previously, hey, you got a great opportunity to go ahead and hit the reset button, so to speak. And if you're one of those who already has those fundamental principles, and we see them, right? We see who were the first movers in the space of just doing what's right, right? We all could probably kick off three, four, five, six, seven, eight different organizations, whether it be a community-based one or a global corporation or anything in between. And so that's really the challenge, you know, figure out what your values are, live your values as best as you possibly can each and every day, and let those be the driver. Because in these moments, that is what is going to push you to one end of the, that tail or the other end of that bell curve tail. And you want to be in the right end. You want to be in the kind, caring, helpful end of that bell curve. Which you also said was the tail end, correct? Well, you know, the bell has two tails, right? And so yeah. in my mind, there's like the not so good tail. Right? That's the <laughs> toxic, greedy, selfish one. And then there's the, the, the positive in this mental framework that I have for this. So, yeah. you know, again, you're, you, you know, and then there's just going to be the rest of, you know, who are just kind of you know, in the middle somewhere. And, and that's okay too. I mean, that's not a judgment statement or a value statement to the, uh, on those, you know, individuals or organizations, et cetera. Um, but I'm talking about the ones who are really remembered, right? It, it, the, they're the ones in the tail and the ones who are in the really on the good end of that tail, there will be a return on investment. And it will be financial. I'm not just talking like from a human standpoint. Um, so there, there is even a financial component to this that I don't want to necessarily dismiss, you know, but that financial component is going to let you continue to do great things in the world because you, you've got the good values to put you there in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, One more question for you sure. on leadership in military, in the military, uh, we usually associate military with a command control authority. And of course, businesses love that because they're under the illusion that you can control the uncontrollable. This shift that we're in will take us out of that mode, I believe. I think that leadership will quickly become divorced from authority and more distributed in nature. What's the military version of that? Yeah, the, well, the military version of that is actually something we call mission command. And what, what that does is it acknowledges the, the, the science, if you will, behind command and control, right? So in its simplest form, that's a, uh, you know, back in the day, it was uh, somebody writing something on a paper, handing it to a runner, and, you know, the runner going and delivering, you know, orders. Um, you know, today we have email, satellite technology, VTCs, all this other, right? So there's a science behind it. But then there's the art behind it as well. 
and the uh, you know the art is really the human component and that's what we talk about in terms of intent right and so you may have heard the uh, phrase you know hey you hire you hire good people and smart people not so you could tell them what to do but that they so they could tell you what to do right <laughs> And, and that's, that's the simplest uh, civilianized version, I guess, of intent-based uh, leadership, where you strip away a little more of the bureaucracy that we've become, quite frankly, abiding to, right? And you see it, you know, all of a sudden, all, all these rules that we used to have, right, are all of a sudden getting lifted. And, and what's happening? Amazing things are happening. I mean, you know, all this, you know, it, it allows that company to go ahead and quickly pivot, get ventilators out on the thing without going through this insane bureaucracy, right? Because you trust humans to do the right thing. And you have, you still have an accountability system in place where when the human doesn't do the right thing, you don't go ahead and throw another layer of bureaucracy on it. You take care and deal with that human as an individual and the whole not the whole system doesn't suffer for it that's a big part of it and trust is a huge component behind that as well trust is just absolutely critical i do a whole separate presentation workshop etc on trust i could go on for hours about that but <laughs> i won't <laughs> fair enough uh john where can people get more information on your work and, and obviously you know, a wealth of of uh, entry points to, to, to work with you because you've got lots of, lots of things there. So where do people go? Yeah. So, uh, John dot O'Grady, uh, O G R A D Y John J O H N at, and then it's all one word, strategic leaders, academy.com. That's okay. my email. John dot oh. O'Grady at strategic leaders, academy.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, John O'Grady. You can find me there. And then Twitter, OG under, underscore leadership. Super. John, I want to thank you very much for being on the program. Uh, really great insights. I love the way you articulate these things that are easy to kind of wash as black and white, but you, you brought it into the reality in terms of how it works in very gray zones. So thank you for taking the time to, to uh, do this program with me. Yeah, no, thank you as well. Uh, and, you know, the important work you do and, and continue to do. So, uh, Donna, thanks for having me. Thanks for allowing me to share. And like I said, I, hopefully I provided some value. It's, it's the Bruce Lee uh, method, right? You take what works, you know, and keep it. Uh, you take what doesn't work, discard it. And, and the one out of item one, what works, you, you take it, you make it your own. And that's all I ever ask when anybody's listening to me or I'm presenting information. So, Hopefully uh, your listeners are, are able to do that. Take care and continue doing great things. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you some more. Well, John O'Grady has given some great suggestions, some great tips for you to use personally in their duration when the period of time we're working with the COVID interruption and also professionally as you think through how you want to reinvent and redesign both your, your work and your decisions inside a company and for the company on the whole to take advantage of this opportunity, this interruption to be far better in the world and for the world and also to create much better workplaces. So great chance for that. Thank you for listening to the program. If you'd like to support this program, you can go to patreon.com forward slash B-A-W-N-A-J-O-N-E-S or you can join me on LinkedIn and connect. And thank you for your support of the program.